are back. Welcome back to the second portion of today's Rex Reviews podcast. I'm Lou McCoy, joined in studio by the legendary Tiborosaurus Rex and Miss Casey Day. We're hanging out, having a good time, and getting ready to get into the nuts and bolts of today's firearms discussion, which will include firing positions. And that's something that really, it varies a lot depending upon what you're doing and what you're shooting and what you're shooting at. That is correct. So if a guy wants to consider the different firing position options out there, what does a guy think of if you think Hollywood, right? Because in the application of delivering, you know, small arms, precision rifle fire on bad guys, potentially, you would watch Hollywood movies. And that's most people's exposure to that whole subject, right? Absolutely. Now, when you think of a Hollywood movie, Lou, where, where would the guy be hiding with the precision rifle? Oh, he'd be in the top of a bell tower somewhere or yep. in the top of a big steeple somewhere where he's got the uh, the viewpoint, the vantage point. Yeah, good field of view, good uh, observation of the whole target there, right? So uh, the interesting thing is, although I'm sure that's been recorded plenty of times in history, and there's been lots of times you talked to a lot of World War II vets and the, a lot of different other people who had to deal with these guys and to take them out, the enemy bad guys, right? If they did see him to identify where they're at, they could put him in a movie of, oh, they must hang out in bell towers because that's where we always found him at. <laughs> but if they were found, that m- means to me they weren't really doing their job very well. And the bell tower is a really stupid place to pick a FFP, a final firing position, because you got noticed up there. Yeah. And if you get noticed when you're up stuck somewhere up on top of a building... If, if you get found while you're up there, that, that's game over, man. Yep, that's all she wrote for you. And of course, this conversation will uh, be talking in a historical context from how this has been done uh, throughout you know modern history. So we're going to be looking at this topic today from a historical perspective and from a hypothetical perspective. Uh, of course, defense of the homeland uh, to maintain our liberty and to maintain our good country here. Uh, for those patriot guys out there who are learning this topic and for soldiers and for law enforcement who need to know how to properly identify where a sniper might be coming from in the event that you'd have to protect innocent good people out there. So this is done. If you're a Lahu uh, fudge bar quoting dude running around uh, trying to hurt people or something, then maybe you should probably turn this off because I'll make fun of you. But uh, other than that, this is for nice good folks who are trying to preserve all those good things in life. The Second Amendment. Exactly. So in the pursuit of liberty and freedom and all that good stuff, where does the history of establishing a good final firing position start? Like, where was the first sniper that, you know, didn't get caught in the bell tower? <laughs> I have no idea because he was know. sneaky enough never to get caught, I'm sure. Well, he did but no, this goes good way job, back though. to the day when even with a bow and arrow, I'm sure, you know, way back in the day, it goes way, you know, I'm sure it's ancient technology and uh, an ancient craft of where to, you know, sneak up on your enemy bad guys there but um with modern rifles with modern scoped rifles really you can start in world war one world war two there's a lot of trench fighting that occurred then and a lot of hard lessons learned and i'm not an expert on uh the full history of it but i do know how it's been refined into its modern employment on the battlefield um you can look the first guy to really refine a lot of these tactics was Carlos Hathcock, and uh, he was a U.S. Marine Corps sniper. He was actually on a shooting team there for a while, real successful guy. He has uh, like 90-some confirmed kills and probably a lot more than that, but he uh, wrote kind of the book on modern uh, sniper craft, if you will, on how to establish a final firing position, select it, and how to kind of go through all the different uh, procedures to deliver an effective sneaky shot. And if you read his accounts, there's a few classic examples of what he did to establish a good uh, firing position. Uh, one in particular, there's a North Vietnamese general that they kind of sent him on a suicide mission to get. And I forget the dude's name. I'm just going off a of memory from like maybe five years ago when I read it last. And uh, But he ended up sneaking past the tree line there's a big clearing way out in the middle of nowhere and he came out there and he had to sneak through a bunch of tall grass he had to crawl like a thousand meters or something yikes through tall grass to get close enough to ensure that you're going to uh, make the hit because you're only going to probably have one shot on a target like that especially one that's well uh, surrounded by the enemy bad guys right so in Carlos Hathcock's case, he took a few days and crawled through that grass at a super slow turtle velocity and finally got close enough to where he'd anticipate he'd see the guy. 
and uh, he poured his canteen out on the, the ground in front of him to wet the dirt so it wouldn't leave a dust signature when he go off. He knew what time it should come. The uh, Air Corps, the Air Force, or whoever it was, uh, gave him the... Uh, weather reports of what kind of climate to expect barometric pressure and all that so he had all his he had all his ballistics worked out ahead of time he was all laid into his position ready to go and when the guy stepped outside that general guy he whacked him and he got away with it actually he did escape and evade out of there and it took him like five minutes to co- like cover the same amount of ground it took him three days to sneak in on <laughs> and he actually survived that mission and he lived to write about it That's so he kind of came up with the whole schooling on how to set up a firing position and if you read the fm 23-10 manual which is the u.s army's manual you can read the equivalent marine corps manual they come up with the same conclusion and that's basically to come up with a position it's going to first of all give you a a, a view of your target area right uh, you want to have the position close enough to be able to take out your target reliably with one shot. It doesn't do you any good to pick a distance too far from where the target is, where you're not 100% sure you're going to actually hit what you're shooting at. This goes for hunting. This goes for law enforcement, hostage mitigation for sure. And this certainly, you know, in certain combat applications like in Afghanistan, where it's just a shoot show and everyone's flinging bullets everywhere, it might not be that critical to have a first shot because they're not going to recognize the difference between machine gun fire and a single rifle shot in the midst of a battle. So you can you can maybe be a, a bit farther out in Afghanistan or something in the middle of a firefight taking out a guy with an RPG uh, with your sniper rifle and you don't need to be as selective with your firing position you just got to deal with the what you have or in a full out war like in uh you know, uh, Iraq or something where your guys are running all over doing a push through Fallujah where there's gunfire going off everywhere. It might not be as selective uh, in the regards of, of getting close enough to ensure a hit positively. You might take more of a risk in shooting further. But in the classic sense of the half cock scenario we just talked about, where you're only going to have one shot, you have to guarantee that hit, especially in a hostage situation for police snipers or something like that, or you have a high value target where you got to take it out and then you got to escape and evade. Uh, you have to be close enough to ensure. A, a kill, basically. But if you look at the stats, most of your police snipers are probably going to engage targets well within 100 yards. It's actually going to be like across the street type distances. So establishing a firing position there is just someplace relatively hidden. Uh, they, you know, there's they, a rooftop or from behind a squad car, underneath a car or in a bush or whatever. But if you're talking about military applications out in rural settings, uh, probably a typical engagement range that they would select a firing position from their target area it'd be around 300 meters uh it would be far enough to get them outside the effective small arms range of the enemy and to where you can maintain concealment but you can still pretty much hit 100 percent of the time what you're aiming at with your precision rifle laying down in your position all comfortably so that's kind of the first thing in the equation is selecting a position that's close enough to your target area yeah, uh, whether that be a deer, or an elk, or a, a jihadist, or whatever the heck, a Nazi in World War II, or whoever you're going to try to fight against, right? Uh, so that's kind of how you would do that. Is you want you want to make sure first of all you're close enough to where you have a hundred percent probability of a hit, or as close to that number as possible, because you're not going to have a second shot, most likely. So that's number one. What's number two? Well, I, I suppose that's a uh, consideration number one. Number two is you want to have concealment, obviously. You want to be in a position where they're not going to expect you to be and where they're not going to see you at, right? In a rural setting, you want to avoid prominent landmarks, prominent peaks, like the highest hill. You don't want to sit right on top of a hill, right on top of a cliff. You want to avoid what they call skylighting, uh, where you are basically against on the horizon. Because you'll stick out like a silhouette then. Absolutely. So you want to be on the military crest of the hill is what they call it in the military. And that's uh, the crest, tactically speaking, is not on the horizon, but just below the horizon, just in front of that last hill so that you are in a good elevated position, but you can still see kind of where you're looking at. And that's a good place to operate from sometimes, um, depending on, I mean, there's infinite different positions possible with the, you know, infinitely complex landscape, but uh, you want to avoid skylining for sure. And you don't want to pick a prominent like rock outcropping or a pointy hill or uh, a, a bell tower, a bell tower. Bad idea. Absolutely. You want to pick something that's totally uh, inconspicuous. 
So it might be the shade underneath a fallen tree stump that's mixed in with 8,000 other fallen tree stumps, not on the top of the hill, but kind of in the valley, but has a good view. Uh, there's a million different options for that. It might have a, a spot where you can find a prominent land feature and you can use that as a distraction and you can be directing your fire from that position and you can be shooting from something adjacent to there far enough to be safe from fire going onto that area. But, uh, you know, so they might think it's coming from that exact spot when in fact you're hiding in something very inconspicuous off to the side again. And a shade is always your friend too. If you can find a shady spot, that saves you a lot of problems. The levels of shade you might experience might be variable. You know, you, you don't want to pick something again that's conspicuous like a culvert or something where someone's going to, if I was this guy, where would I be? So that's kind of where like a, a well-trained sniper in the first world army is probably going to select his firing position in some place where you were the last place you're going to look with your binoculars because it's like, oh, it's just that slightly different gray patch in the field of different colors. And then there's a clump of trees where you're expecting him to be. Meanwhile, he's over in this field hiding behind a piece of sage or something that you didn't even assume he would be at, right? You didn't look twice at it. So that's another big consideration is avoid conspicuous stuff. So it's important to be inconspicuous with your location. It's also important to be close enough. We are going to make the shot. Uh, there's also the escape and evade. That yep, one- that's a very important deal if you want to plan and survive in the deal, right? Is uh, you got to have a route picked ahead of time. And you got to anticipate this when you're considering the terrain of your firing position. Uh, you pr- preferably want to have a route where you can just slip kind of backwards down behind defile or somewhere that's hidden totally. Uh, so you're not moving where it's visible. You want to be out of the line of sight. If you can if you can set it up that way, that's a really good way to go. And it's also good to have it set up in a spot where you might have multiple escape and evasion routes um, because it might be compromised one of the different legs of the route So, uh, to get back to your objective rally point. So typically what you're going to do when you're deployed on one of these deals is you're going to have an objective rally point first. That's where you're going to, like you jump out of your helicopter or your whatever, you know, and uh, you're going to have your equipment, most of your equipment that you're going to need to serve survive the march or whatever and your other peripheral equipment that you're going to need to get from to get up to the final firing position which is going to be right on the front lines there right you're going to have an objective rally point first and that's where you're going to put stash all your extra stuff your extra food your extra shovels whatever you're not going to actually need to make the shot right so that's where you're going to put that stuff and then from that point you're going to switch into gear to get up to the final firing position that's where you would do your low crawl with your ghillie suit on out in the bush or whatever so uh that's what they're doing there and uh, you're gonna have probably a spotter and a shooter and they'll be uh, working their way up to the final firing position and um, when they get anywhere's within line of sight with uh, the target area they're gonna be extra sneaky mode moving incredibly slowly and this is all stuff you can read it's approved for public release it's public information uh u.s army field manual fm 23-10 covers that topic very well and something i'm not going to get into a lot of detail about on this tutorial series that i'm making on sniper 101 or in the podcast because it's all public information and a field craft is something that's very well covered by many other people i like to maintain uh the momentum of the show in the uh where you have a crossover with more competition shooting, more hunting, you know, uh, tactical precision shooting, competition, stuff like that. Uh, But just for the informational purposes, when you're talking about the skill set that an actual military sniper would have in a combat situation, that's most of that is going to be in the field craft section, or at least half of it. And then the other half is actually, you know, operating the weapon effectively so i'm concentrating more on the weapon handling stuff in my series in the tutorials but um that and also the historical context of everything absolutely because it's very interesting and it's just something to have in mind and this is totally applicable to large game hunting as well or a varmint hunting uh this can be applicable as well this is more of a hypothetical question but you were kind of talking about the military application what would be the best option for somebody if they're out there and uh, and they have oncoming fire. Like, is it just best to get out of there, or do you think that they should take the shot? 
Well, if you if you have oncoming fire before you take the shot, I mean, you're probably drawn into the fight. And I mean, there's uh, infinite scenarios that could happen, you know, uh, preferably they're not going to know anything that happened until it happens. And so that's the ideal situation. It's totally contingent upon multiple uh, scenarios that could possibly happen and like what your evasion routes are, how important it is for you to actually get the shot off to that target. But uh, if you're taking fire, before you make the shot, then you, you pretty much got to abort and just, just probably survive, right? But uh, if you're taking fire after you make the shot, um, they're probably not going to have a good idea exactly where you were if you did your job correctly. So they're going to, a lot of times you are going to get a fire response where they're just going to start shooting randomly in that general direction, like just trying to lay down cover fire so they can move to their positions. So, I mean, I would expect that if you're in a combat scenario and uh, you're going to take one of those shots, they're going to start just shooting everywhere. Um, A lot of times in the opposite direction. Uh, So don't let it nerve wrack you too much. They probably haven't pinpointed you. And at that point, and and really from a firing position, and that's a good question because that leads me to the next deal, you're only going to fire once or twice from any given firing position, especially in a wide open rural type setting where you are you and your team is the only people out there on your side and it's a bunch of bad guys you're going to fire one shot after you fire one shot they're going to have a pretty good idea after that second shot at kind of where you are and you don't want to you don't want to shoot multiple rounds you want to shoot as least as possible from one spot you're going to relocate to a different hide a different area a different final firing position a continue to engage but it's contingent too another example is uh carlos halfcock in the vietnam war um the marine sniper he and his spotter, I think his name was Burke. They uh, Carlos Hathcock was equipped with a thirty out six. I think it was a Winchester Model seventy with a heavy barrel that was kind of uh, modified by the Marine Corps armorers there, and that was his rifle of choice. And he used that for his competition shooting too. Uh, he was like a he, he'd win the medals, you know, for competition shooting. So he was very very deadly out to a thousand meters and uh, even beyond that sometimes. And uh, him and his spotter Burke they spotted a company of North Vietnamese soldiers, brand new guys. He could tell they were fresh because their AKs were just brand new, shiny, oiled. They had clean uniforms on. They all looked pretty young. They were all kind of just stumbling along. And there was the guy in the back who was yelling orders, the old guy in the back. And then the guy in the front looked like he was actually had peripheral awareness, like he knew what was going on. And it was a whole company of guys which is like on the order of 100-some dudes probably, okay? Maybe 80, maybe 100-some. I forget what the number was. But a company is a pretty good number of people to try to engage when it's you with a bolt action and your spotter, who does happen to have an M1A or an M14, you know, with a variable scope on it. And uh, But they decided to engage. I think they're at 800 meters. And uh, from their position, they had a very good position. They're fighting against green soldiers. And the soldiers were crossing a rice paddy in an area... Uh, like they have the little uh, berms that you can walk across to get in between the fields, right? Mm-hmm. And so they're walking across a very narrow piece of dry land. And so they arranged it. They took out the lead and the tail, and they took out the commander on the first wave of fire. Boom, boom, boom. Like all of a sudden, they made the shots. And the rest of the guys were instantly panicked and didn't know what to do because the entire chain of command was completely wiped out instantly. And so Burke, he had a semi-automatic, and then Hathcock was pretty quick with his bolt action. They took out another string of guys while they were standing confused until they took cover behind the berm and the rice paddy. And some of them probably took cover on the wrong side and got whacked because they didn't know what side it was coming from even. Uh, So they had a good firing position. And then for the next three days, they maintained that firing position, that same position. Um, because they had enough cover and concealment. Covers were actually, you know, behind stuff that's going to stop bullets. And concealment is just being hidden. So there's a difference there, right? Um, But uh, they had a good position, and they ended up calling in illumination rounds at night with artillery to uh, basically illuminate the field like every 10, 15 minutes at a kind of a constant rhythm so them guys couldn't sneak away. And every time one of them would peek out to try to find them, they'd like a prairie dog. And this is all terrible stuff, you know, but it's just history. They would shoot the guy's head off, right? And so some of them kind of after a day or two, they started getting thirsty because they're sitting in this human feces rice paddy situation. They started running for it. And so they took those guys out. And then they tried to actually, they organized a counteroffensive because they kind of found out the general idea where those guys were. And so they charged one time and they were firing and they took those guys out. And then they did some sneaky moves one night. They, they paused the illumination rounds coming in until uh, they said, okay, let's wait like 10 minutes before the next illumination round is dark. They'll probably try escaping after 15 minutes, you know, because they, they're not very comfortable where they're at for the last couple of days. 
And um, so they paused, and then they called in illumination. They turned the lights back on, and sure, here's half the rest of the live guys trying to sneak away. So they took those guys out. Yikes! And then eventually, they got so tired sleeping in shifts, they just called in artillery and blew them all away. But yeah, so that's an example of where in a combat situation you might maintain a firing position dependent on you know the the multiple circumstances. But ideally, you would want to get out of there as fast as possible. Just shoot one shot, maybe two shots, and get out of there. But there's some other uh, ways that this is executed as well. Mobile firing positions. In Iraq, there were some very effective army snipers uh, when they're doing these high-speed pushes through a lot of these towns. And... Um, they would ride around in Humvees and just drive and shoot off the back of the car like they're hunting rabbits. Wow. And they were making decent shots at the rifles, but they, they uh, did high speed. So it was none of the sneaky stuff setting up the, the, uh, the hide with uh, you know entrenching yourself into the ground and this full concealment. They just uh, depended on chaos and high speed. And so they just drove from place to place or they'd get on top of a roof. They'd take three or four shots and they'd run like heck. And they get to a whole different area and they shoot from there so no one knew what direction it was coming from. And there's even modern examples of criminals doing stuff like that. But uh, yeah, those are just examples historically of, of kind of what how different positions are utilized. There's a million different ways to, to do it, but that's kind of how it's done a lot of times. So speaking of different situations, we've kind of talked about the military application, but what about something like hunting, like sniping... A deer, a deer, <laughs> hunting a deer. I mean, you wouldn't Absolutely. necessarily, depending on the situation. But what? Well, with the deer, you got to so you always got to take into account who or what you're trying to get, right? So for a deer, they have like super awesome vision. They can hear like amazingly, dude. One time we we're sitting up on top of this bank and uh, we're just glassing these deer, you know. And uh, it was a calm day, though, no wind. And they were like probably 1,200 yards out there. And they're just kind of walking along the, the river bottom area, kind of just grazing, you know, browsing, doing their thing. One of my uh, one of the folks who my old man used to hang out, a bunch of real hardcore old school cowboy guy. He runs a sharps, and but he he knows his deal, and he's a really effective shooter with a rifle scope too. And uh, so I was kind of following his lead. I was just a young guy at the time, and I didn't realize how quiet you have to be when you're hunting a deer, right? And so we're up there on this ridge, and we're just kind of glassing him, and he's giving me like hand signals in slow motion, because. Motion is something when you're in your position to your firing position. This works for anything. If you're totally still, you're very hard to see and your camouflage is effective. But if you're moving around, fidgeting around, moving, turning your head, any quick movements, it's going to draw the eye. Any kind of mammal's eyeballs going straight towards movement. So a deer hunter really knows how this deal works, even more so than probably a military sniper, because a deer is like the best spotter on earth because they don't got army tanks and artillery to defend. They just got to know what's coming around the corner, right? They have to be peripherally aware of everything at all times. Yeah. Hyper awareness is required for life on a deer, right? Because they, I mean, that's a deer, right? Yeah. That's how they live. Absolutely. They're always out there in the elements trying to survive. And absolutely. And you know, back in the day when we had pointy sticks, you had to be a lot more sneaky, too. So we do have that locked up in our epigenetic code, I'm sure. Oh, yeah. We can be sneaky if we need to. Uh, but with that story with the deer up there, uh, he was talking to me in slow motion, moving his hands, and he was not voicing out even a sound at all, not even breathing, not whispering or nothing. But I could I could see his mouth moving, but he's doing it in slow motion. I thought, man, you're a little overboard. What, are you trying to be cool or something, you know? And then I had a Mini-14 Ruger rifle on me, right? And the bolt handle just made the slightest little tink kind of deal, like it just rattled. Just And it wasn't even a rattle. It was just a tink, like metal on metal just touched. And all those deer, boom, ears lit up. They both got fully erect. Their heads popped up, and they looked straight at us. <laughs> and they're like, and they're looking, and we all paused, and my eyeballs turned towards them. And they're looking, but we're totally still. And then I was like, holy smokes, from 1,200 yards, they could hear that. And then they, they kind of got nervous and they just, they escaped and evaded, man. They just turned around and walked away, man. Smart critters. Yeah, they're smart. They're incredible. And the vision is the same thing, especially on antelope. If you're hunting pronghorn antelope, holy smokes, some things can see for like five miles. Good luck sneaking up on one of them guys during hunting season anyways. I mean, good luck. 
So in hunting, uh, you have to consider all those things when you're selecting your position. You want to be in a spot where they're not going to expect it. And actually, my old man, there's abandoned uh, old church houses and schoolhouses around. There's been times where he took up the position in the steeple because (laughs) it's a good observation point and the deer's not going to shoot at you. But that's just the other thing. If you're hunting and the deer is not shooting back... Uh, then you know you can all go options the bell are tower. on the table you don't need to worry about escape and evasion you don't need to worry about uh skylining is important you probably don't want to skyline they can see that quite easily uh but having good cover obviously is a good way to go there too as well and just being still and quiet and aware because really with a deer or a lot of game just being still is kind of the trick and even if you oh, go ahead, sister. Oh, sorry. Um, well, what about uh, an animal that could attack something more lethal, like a bear or dangerous game? Yeah, dangerous type of. Game. Oh, that's more. That's not. You're not going to probably be doing long range precision shooting on those guys. Uh, uh, you know, a lot of times you will, but like in a classic hunting sense, like. I think if you're just harvesting deer, and this is my personal opinion now, uh, I don't have a problem with hunters shooting at long range on deer within that distance where you're 100% sure you're going to kill them, you know, humanely, because you don't want them just like gut hit them all the time and they're screaming for life and bleeding out in front of all their deer children. That's terrible. I've seen it a lot of times, you know. Uh, I only did that once and I only made one sloppy hit on a deer that was just really gruesome and I I didn't want to do that anymore. I felt like a bad person and an irresponsible hunter at that point. But I was a kid, so I learned and I said, okay, I'm not going to shoot when they're running that fast until, I mean, when a deer is running 30 miles an hour, like at a weird angle jumping, I mean, you might hit it, and I did, and he went down, but he was not happy for a while. I had to shoot him a few more times to get him, you know? Mm -hmm. And then once the adrenaline kicks in, the meat shot. Uh, So, yeah, it's kind of a gruesome deal hunting. But on Dangerous Game, you know, classically, uh, if you're going to be one of the guys who gets off on the rush of, like, shooting a lion or a leopard or a rhinoceros or something, they got big guns, and those things are hiding in brush. So that's close range type stuff. That's a whole different application. But there and there that's another thing where they're they're they have a position. The firing position is obviously where they're at, but they're trying to maintain their level of awareness. This is big for any position, is gonna have to outdo the level of awareness of the prey, the predator and prey. Like the predator has to spot the prey first so that it can decide so then that's in the advantage. If the prey spots you first, then they're gonna like a thousand times worse off right mm-hmm. so in in those respects a lot of guys will walk very slow very deliberately very carefully not stepping on too much stuff make if you are making noise you're going to do slow motion uh they call it slow hunting my old man taught us this when we we're little guys like when i was five it was the first time he took me out bow hunting in the trees down by the creek outside of the small small town where i was uh you know where i grew up and uh I remember him whispering and kind of where walking and pointing at sticks. Is that a deer's antler? No, that's not a deer's antler. You got to be quiet. No, and he's teaching me how to do it. But uh, still hunting is, and this is very applicable for tactical applications as well when you're on patrol, okay, is um, you are moving at like one hundredth the speed you would walk at. And you're looking with your eyeballs. You're not turning your head anywhere. And if you have to talk or turn your head to look at someone, it's all eye eye contact communication. If you flip a hand signal or something, it's super slow motion. And every step, you're just like, all right, your heel goes down and you're listening. Okay, oh, I crunched. I better slow down. And you're going to crunch the leaves in such slow motion to where it blends in with the background ambient noise. And then you can sneak right into a bunch of deer sitting in for dinner on their branch. Yep. And you can walk within five feet of them if, standing upright. If you're wearing camouflage and you don't smell too weird and you're, you got your wind right, you know, I mean, if the wind's not uh, in your favor, then they'll smell you too. But if you got everything else right, you can still hunt your way right into a group of deer that would normally see you from them 1200 yards away and run like hell. So there's uh, that's a very important thing. And that's a huge thing about concealment and camouflage and a firing position, just being still, not fidgeting. Well said, Mr. Rex. Of course, this all varies with your application and environment, and a rural hunting setting is going to be totally different than something in an urban setting. Yeah, an urban setting is a whole different animal. There's there's a whole other dynamic going on there. And that's something if you guys want to get into from a historical context, you can look at examples. There's lots of different books that snipers like. Snipers like to brag about everyone they shot or whatever when they write their books, right? <laughs> so you can read their books on how they did that if that's your deal. Uh, 
Uh, you can also look at the training manuals, have very good ideas of how to set up a room hide uh, in the back of a room where they're not going to see hanging a rifle barrel out the window and stuff like that, or different positions in between floors of old buildings and uh, you know how to do a loophole situation, how to calculate that your shot gets through a small hole um, in the same line of sight that your scope is at so that you don't shoot into the wall because you got to consider that your bore's under your scope, right? So there's all those tricks and stuff you can look up in the military manuals that were approved for public release. Not my responsibility. You guys go look it up if that's your deal um, from a historical context. Or if you're studying to be a military sniper, um, or a police, you know, uh, sharpshooter or something, then that's something you want to be aware of. Or just any kind of law enforcement guy in general should probably be aware of this, especially nowadays with it getting so heated everywhere. Everyone's all mad at each other, shooting at everybody. Uh, this is information that law enforcement and any kind of good sheepdog type person should have in the back of their mind. In case you start taking precision rifle fire from some weirdo or some whack job, uh, it is good to understand these concepts so that you can get the hell out of the line of fire hopefully and like rex said if you want to learn more the internet is a big place there's lots of books out there and information is practically free so check it out educate yourselves and stick around we'll be back with more of the rex reviews podcast right after this Little round thing over. 